So welcome everybody, we're going to start now. Uh, my name is Jim Sandercock, I'm the chair of the Alternative Energy Program at NEAT, and this uh, is Dave uh, Dodge, he is with Green Energy Futures, and I think many of you have probably seen good programming by Green Energy Futures covering all sorts of exciting things. Um, one of the things that's uh, really cool for me is uh, we were episode number two, right? And uh, that, was, that, was, that was good. That's great. You can still find that on, on his uh, channel. So we're today going to be talking about the future of energy, giving you inspiring stories about the people uh, who are involved in the green energy revolution. There's lots of people who have been um, uh, uh, sort of plowing the way. Uh, and now as things are becoming a little bit more mainstream, uh, those are the folks that we really appreciate their their efforts uh, in moving us forward. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the effect that green energy can have on businesses and communities as well. And we're going to double team this. This is the first time I've ever done this. So I'm actually looking forward to this. This should be fun. And, and with Jim, uh, I'm really looking forward to it in particular because we did our second story three years ago uh, in our series about Nate. And I still think it's one of the best uh, alternative energy programs in the country. No question. Um, so I'll start out with, uh, I'm with Green Energy Futures, my name is David Dodge. I've been producing this series and traveling across the country for three years now, doing nothing but chasing down stories of the most inspiring people and the most interesting projects uh, at the cutting edge of the green energy revolution. I started doing this because I was working on really tough issues of climate change and energy issues and environmental impacts, and you can only do that for so long, and then you get to go have more fun doing something else. And so I thought, if I could do anything in my life right now, what would it be? And, and I wrote it down and I said I would travel across the country and I would share these stories in videos, on radio, and in magazines, and in print about people who are involved in the green energy revolution because it was, it was my sense that the people were more inspiring, the solutions were more robust uh, than any of us know, and that they, there was just literally tons of myths out in the media. And so I thought this would be a contribution I could make. And so that's why I started the series. And I'm here because um, I happen to be the chair of a program that teaches a lot of different energy systems. Um, and uh, it's, it's about a four-year-old program now. And, uh, and our program just happens to overlay very effectively or very uh, in alignment with a lot of the changes and the, the drivers of technical change um, that's actually that's actually occurring. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about our students, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our curriculum, and it's going to really help set things up for when we talk about some of the other technologies and the applications of the technologies that we're actually seeing um, being, being deployed globally, um, and particularly exciting for us, uh, even in our cold and snowy climate. So just to let you know a little bit about our students, um, our students happen to be a very large proportion of them are retooling their careers. So they've already had a career perhaps in oil and gas or some other, uh, some other um, uh, technical area. Uh, some of them are coming to us with uh, trades under their belt already. Um, we have people that are coming to us that have full degrees and we have people coming to us with uh, various other experiences and sometimes high school. Um, our average age right now in our program is 26 years old. Um, of our 28 students that just joined our program this year, actually only two of them are right out of high school. So a very interesting demographic. In terms of where our alumni land, um, there's almost as many stories as there are grads from our program. Some of them are getting into renewable energy installations, so that might be solar, that might be something else. Many of them are getting into system design in only two to three years after graduating and being involved in installation, now getting into design. In our field, somebody who's been at it for five, six years is a grandpappy in the industry, which is really exciting. Um, in terms of our program, 13% um, of our grads have actually gone on to start their own companies, so a very strong entrepreneurial bent. As a two-year technical diploma, that's unheard of. Um, in terms of uh, some of our grads are also doing project management already, uh, working on business development, doing work in the bioenergy sphere, and doing uh, bench scale or pilot scale research. In terms of our actual program, it's a two-year diploma. We cover all the, the usual suspects, solar, geo, wind. Energy storage is exciting. It's an up-and-comer for sure. It's sort of got the cost curves and the, the uh, growth curves that are very similar to what happened in, in wind, a decade ago, solar about four to five years ago, uh, and it's really moving ahead. Microhydro, we teach a little bit about that. Uh, fuel cell used to be a, a big deal, and uh, then it kind of got quiet and 
Toyota recently is saying, actually, we're going to really back fuel cells. So we could see something coming back there. And then we also teach about fuel, biofuel and bioenergy. When we get into the second year, this is where we talk, stop talking about just putting really fancy energy generating appliances out, which would be sort of our first year, where people stop thinking about things as like once you got your solar system on, isn't that the whole story? But there's actually some really important things that are going to transform the next stage of transformation, understanding economic and business and how to um, sell uh, an energy plan to somebody who really wants to do what's good but has to convince a board of governors that it makes some sort of economic sense. Um, project management, integrating systems into pre-existing buildings, bringing different systems together in terms of hybridization, looking at life cycle analysis, what's the environmental impact, getting into energy management, how do you take an entire organization or municipality through a very intelligent and well thought out energy plan and then have people actually within the organization buy in and start changing behavior because behavior is a huge component. And then our students also do a capstone project where they have about 300 hours where they go work with an actual company uh, and take on a particular project. So very intense two years, but I did just want to highlight that it goes beyond the mere uh, introduction of energy systems and really gets into some of these other areas as well. And I can attest that uh, Jim's students are successful because as I've traveled across the country doing my stories for the last years, I keep running into his students again and again and again. Um, after doing this for three years, what I've found is a couple of really simple ideas. One, that the green energy revolution is underway. If you weren't aware of that, now you are. Number two, that uh, the solutions are far more robust than most people realize. Yes, there's corny ideas out there. There's even ideas that try to defy the laws of physics. But there are a ton of really good ideas that actually work. Uh, and thirdly, that the piece of innovation right now is almost inconceivable to any one of us. Why? Because we don't see the big picture of the whole industry. We see our little bubble, our little piece of the bubble, uh, and think, we're, you know, stuff's going slow, whatever. I've looked at this from the big picture, and this is the most stunning uh, period of innovation in a number of these technologies in the history of humankind. Even if you just look at buildings, green buildings, for example, I was, I was talking to a big builder in Edmonton, and he told me, he was trying to explain to me just how, how fast things are changing right now, and this is a builder of big commercial buildings, and he said, the green stuff that's happened in the last decade is, represents a bigger change than adding structural steel to the building industry in the late 1800s. That's a pretty big change. I didn't say that. That was a builder that said that. So uh, a couple of observations, and these aren't rocket science, but after doing this for three years, um, here's some of my simple observations that solar will be a dominant force of energy uh, in the future, absolutely no question. That wind power is already cheap and already competitive in many places in the world. That more, sometimes the solutions, energy, clean energy solutions, aren't just about the energy. Sometimes they offer benefits that in some cases are even greater than the benefit of producing energy. And so I would put, uh, in some cases, biomass, biogas, and, and other uh, technologies like that offer tremendous environmental solutions, diversification on the farm, uh, plus they happen to produce energy. And we'll talk more about that later. Green buildings will become the norm. We're on that path. We're way ahead of the building codes, uh, the innovation that's happening right now. And right here in this city, we're at the center of some of the highest level innovation in North America, or perhaps the world, in green buildings right here in Edmonton. Batteries will change everything. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it will. It's going to change everything in terms of home, how we run our homes, our cars, Everything will be affected by batteries, and that's going to come on much faster than you're thinking right now. The future will be more distributed, more renewable, and much more diverse, and much more chaotic. In the past, we built monstrous power plants. They produced a lot of power. Check, you're done. The future is going to be many, many different kinds of energy production, from solar to uh, wind to all kinds of different things, all kinds of different energy uh, conservation methods. All these things are going to combine in a strategic way to produce a very innovative uh, future for us. So let's look first at how solar energy and why solar energy is going to become a big part of our future. So um, this happens to be a map of two different countries. One country is by far the biggest producer of renewable energy on the entire planet. And the other one is ranked like number nine. 
or 10, or maybe 11. And uh, what we have here is a map showing how much sunlight actually hits these two different countries. The one on the right, of course, is Germany. And you can see on the scale that its production, its amount of insulation or solar light hitting the country is pretty low. The one on the left is Canada. And you can see the, the red areas and the orange areas and the yellow areas all produce, all have more sunlight hitting the surface than they'd have happening in Germany. And yet Germany is the one who's way out ahead in terms of adoption. One of the myths and one of the concerns that often gets raised is, but aren't we too far north for solar to make sense here in Edmonton, for example? Isn't it too snowy for us to do solar in Edmonton? So just a couple of numbers. Hamburg, Germany, 53 degrees latitude north. 1,064 sun hours per year. If you want to know what sun hours, you can ask me later. In comparison, Edmonton, also 53 degrees latitude, 1,685 sun hours a year. And when you can factor in also that we've got colder temperatures and that makes the electronics work better, we, per module, would produce about 60% more energy from about 60% more sunlight on the same piece of equipment in Edmonton compared to Hamburg in Germany. So very significant that we do have enough sunlight hours, even at our high latitude compared to many other places. So the next question is, so what about snow? Lots of us are very concerned and very focused on snow. We live in a snowy place. And so one of the other questions is, okay, so maybe it'll be 60% better than Hamburg, but we get so much more snow, won't that really reduce our performance? So we worked with the wonderful people down at the bottom there, um, the City of Edmonton Solar Energy Society of Alberta, uh, Gordon Howell from Howell Mayhew and Great Canadian Solar. We worked with them to actually build what we've started colloquially calling the solar ski jump, which you can see here. And basically what we've got is we've got an, uh, an attempt here to actually answer the question, does snow have a big a big impact and we clear one set of those modules at one angle and then the other module at the same angle we just leave it alone and let the snow either fall off or melt off or just stay there all by itself. That allows us to actually for all these different roof angles, the, the 312, the 412, the 612, et cetera angles, we can actually start figuring out what the actual impact of snow happens to be. So what I'd like you to do is think in your head for a moment how big a chunk do you think snow takes out of an annual production for solar? Given that even, a, an, even an eighth of an inch of snow is enough to basically take the module production down to zero. So th just think in your head, what percentage of a chunk does, do you think that might take out? And this is what our uh, thing actually looks like. You can see the snow starting to melt and fall off on the right hand side, but we'd cleared the other ones. And you can see on the left just how much production we actually happen to have. Turns out, the actual effect is about 5% on an annual basis. That's about it, even on the lowest angle. So do we have solar resources in Alberta, in Edmonton? Yes. Does snow kill us in production? Not really. So if you have modules, by the way, don't go up and clear them off and risk yourself on the ladder. So these are really important realizations that we've come to understand and some of the myths we have to bust, but it also shows us that there's a great opportunity for solar, as an example, in the Edmonton area. Great, and so our, we're going to do a little storytelling from my series here as well to help tell the story of uh, green energy, and in this particular instance, solar. So our story begins in Alberta, in a county called Starland County in southern Alberta, population 2,000, uh, it's 1,998 farmers and two gas station owners. Uh, and Bob Sargent here, he's, he's one of the councillors of the municipal government. And uh, they got involved with solar about 10 years ago because they live in a place where it, they have not a lot of clean water and the clean water they do have, they need to move it around the county so that they, people can use it. There's not a power everywhere, they need to move the water. And so they decided to use solar. So 10 years ago, they built this monument to uh, the sol solar <laughs> industry and they paid $155,000 for that 10 kilowatt system not 10 years ago. These guys weren't to be daunted though, so they thought, Surely we can do this cheaper. Prices were, came down after that time. Their knowledge went up. A whole bunch of other things conspired. And lo and behold, these guys did a program with their municipal government last year to install 10 systems on 10 farmers' properties for $30,000 and less for each system. So that's $3 a watt, which is a price that makes it price competitive today. 
So why does solar have a sunny future? We're going to play this out a little bit, but a few very, very simple reasons. People want solar. It's really hard to turn to somebody on the street and say, do you think solar is a good idea or a bad idea? It's, you don't get a lot of people say it's a bad idea. Number two, it has few enemies except perhaps competitors, but it really doesn't have a lot of enemies, it doesn't have a lot of protesters, uh, and so solar is that likable renewable energy. Uh, solar is also getting cheaper, better, and more cost competitive, and that's really a loaded sentence. The efficiency of solar modules continues to increase every year. I was just reading about solar modules that are, I think, 19% efficient this week, uh, coming out from two different companies. 22% Jim says now. See, it went up since I, I last checked the internet. Uh, and the price keeps coming down, which you'll see in a minute. So it's already getting cost competitive. Solar is a cost competitive way of, of generating electricity in 65 countries in the, in the world right now already today. Solar produces the lowest emissions. I say nearly zero because you do have to manufacture the systems, you have to install them. Uh, but after that, it's pretty much zero emission. It works at small and large scale. Now this is very important. Those farmers I just told you about it who did it for $3 a watt, if you're doing, we'll tell you more about this in a minute, but if you're doing a really large system, a super awesome price would be 280 a watt or 260 a watt. So even at scale today, it's affordable small and large. So this is to show you what, when we say crazy and, and logarithmic and earth changing and earth shattering and all these things that you'll hear, this is why we talk about it. This would be... Uh, this is called the Swanson Curve, and it shows you that the cost of manufacturing for solar has been dropping really significant. From the 70s at over um, $70 a watt to today at uh, maybe 36 to 76 cents a watt, depending on which, which system you go with, that's the price decline that we've been seeing, and we continue to see the price decline occurring as well. So we've got over 100 times lower price in 36 years. We find that if you have to build a new coal plant, it's actually cost effective versus some things like coal and new natural gas generation. Um, if you were to throw in the effects, the environmental uh, effects, the benefits that you get from some of the renewables, especially solar, if you were to put those greenhouse gas uh, and, and uh, health effects into the equation without any subsidy, solar would be cheaper than coal and natural gas. Um, as David was talking, we're going to talk a little bit about cost, but you can get installations now for under $3 a watt, where it used to be much, much higher. We've seen great successes where there's been some sort of an attempt by government to equal or balance the playing field a little bit. We call those uh, subsidies. Um, but the truth of the matter is that there's actually subsidies for all energy generation. If nothing else, um, you're getting a subsidy by the fact that a coal plant can put... No, oh, sorry about that. just threw me off a little. It's a good song, though. Um, your coal plant is going to be putting stuff in the atmosphere that is going to have to be borne. The cost of that pollution is going to be borne by other components of your society, for example, health costs. So how is solar doing in the world? Well, you can see that even though the technology was, uh, has been worked on for many, many decades, that it really started taking off, say, 2005, the same year our farmer friends in Starland County built the $155,000 10 kilowatt solar system, and since then has absolutely skyrocketed. That's the curve right there to 2014. Uh, even between 2012 and 2014, it went from 100, uh, 100,000 gigawatts, sorry, 100 gigawatts, is that right? Yep. Yes, to 178 gigawatts. The growth curve is crazy, and this year's is probably going to be the same. Do I have another piece of this? Yes. So you asked, where is solar in the world rocking right now? We already gave away the answer. So Germany is definitely the biggest jurisdiction in the world. And remember, almost all of Canada has better, better solar than almost all of Germany. So just remember that piece. Uh, and the second places in the world are China, the rest of the EU, and... I added this little thing. That's uh, Canada right there, uh, the little um, orange thing. We wouldn't even be on this map if it wasn't for Ontario, because Ontario has installed more than 2,000 uh, megawatts of solar in recent years. So we are on the map, though, and uh, just getting started, I hope. Yes. Um, just a bit more to the cost curves. Um, if you look at this graph, this is for the United States. They keep really good data. Um, we really don't. But if you look at the cost curve here, um, you can see what Dave was showing for the globe. Uh, the amount of installation that's happened in the United States starting in 2000 there, about four, 
uh, megawatts through to, to 2013, you can see an, a, what we call a logarithmic increase in the amount of solar being installed, which is really difficult, by the way, for business people to wrap their head around. How many staff do I need? You see things in Hawaii where they were like a sole proprietorship, and then two years later, they had two or three staff, and then two years later, they have 30 staff, and a couple years later, they have 50 staff. Like It's, it's crazy and really difficult to to deal with, but very exciting. So you can see this really increasing uh, ski slope sort of uh, increase in the amount of installations. The dotted line that happens to be there happens to be the cost per watt to install. And you can see that it's been declining really significantly, especially after 2009. And a really exciting thing is that Jim Hughes from one of the largest solar manufacturing companies in the world, his company is projecting that they will probably be able to get to an installation cost of a dollar per watt uh, by the late 2017 for, um, for uh, commercial installations or uh, utility grade installations, which is, is just unbelievable and almost nobody on this planet has been successful, not even Greenpeace, has been successful in predicting where these things are likely to go. So how's solar doing uh, in our neighbor to the south, the US? Well, 1,030, uh, 1,300 megawatts of solar was installed in Q1 this year alone, and that's the sixth straight quarter with more than a megawatt of, of solar being installed in the US. That rep represents, about 25% of that represents residential solar that's been installed without any state incentives already. The more than 51% of all new electric generating capacity in the U.S. came from solar in Q1 of 2015. So half of all the new generating capacity built in the U.S. this year uh, was solar for the first half of the year. This is your slide. Sure thing. <laughs> so, and this just shows you a really exciting thing about where the industry is going in terms of numbers of jobs. Um, Solar, the solar industry is not just booming, it's actually eclipsing other areas. For example, there are now more people employed in solar in the United States, the yellow thing, versus coal jobs in the United States. So we're actually on the inside of an industrial revolution. So that's pretty amazing to, if you've ever wondered what was it like when they went from oil from whales to oil from petroleum products back in the 1850s or something like that, you've always, what, what, what would that be like? This is it, so very exciting. Now, some companies and, and, and environmental groups have been trying to figure out what the transition is likely to be. And so lots of transitions, lots of transitional conversation and thinking and projecting of what's gonna happen in the future. This happens to be one of those roadmaps saying this is a very likely a scenario for going forward by the 2100. So by the end of this century, the concept in this particular one is that 38% of our energy will be coming from solar and oil. We may still be taking it out of the ground, but we probably will be burning a lot less of it. Might be about 10%, very different than today. Biofuels about nine and a half. Natural gas would still be at play, etc. So you can see there's a lot of renewables here. There's a lot of excitement here, and you might think. Who are these crazy people that put this plan together? It's this little company, you may have heard of them, called Shell. <laughs> and so it's really exciting, but also very solid projections that we're seeing about what our future is gonna be, and it involves a lot more of the renewables. And Shell's not the only one making uh, scenarios like that. You can look at Bloomberg, you can look at any number of scenarios. There are many scenarios projecting solar's dominance in the future. And Shell has other scenarios, by the way, where solar doesn't play as big a role. The point is that it's going to change, and it's going to change dramatically. This is a very interesting curve. The, these are uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and the little red dotted line there represents where they should be at, that scientists have told us where they should be at, if we want to stay under an increase of global uh, average temperature of two degrees Celsius. This, the three other lines up there are Shell's scenarios. So one of the scenarios we just looked at was one of those scenarios. So even if we do that scenario, that's the emissions uh, profile of that scenario. But that's not what's interesting about this slide to me. What's interesting about this is this, these are three scenarios from an oil company, but you'll notice something happening here. They're not staying at the two degrees, and maybe, who knows, maybe we'll pull a rabbit out of our hat and we'll figure out a way to do that. But whether we do or we don't, even Shell is predicting it's going to peak and we're going to have to drop our reliance on uh, things that produce uh, emissions. So all of their scenarios do that. So they all peak and go down. The only question, the only issue is when we're going to do that.
So now we're going to take you on a quick little tour to bring you back to Alberta. So what is happening across Canada? You saw that little pie chart at the beginning that showed Canada is actually on the map internationally for solar. It's on the map because of one place, Ontario. Uh, Ontario has installed or committed to installing 8,000 megawatts of renewable energy since 2009. It's one of the fastest transitions anywhere in the planet. At the same time, they also dropped six megawatts of coal completely gone in that same period of time. So what that has resulted in, their feed and tariff programs, and let's not talk about all the messy parts of it right now, there's lots to talk about there, but let's just talk about results. In terms of results, they have 2,300 megawatts of solar in Ontario today. So there are, I think it's more than 10,000, or it might even be a lot bigger than that. Uh, people in Ontario have solar on their homes. When we get a little bit closer to home, uh, the largest to date um, uh, single installation of solar happened to happen in Kimberley. The first one to hit one megawatt was in Kimberley. You may know Kimberley for its skiing. At one point they had a huge mining industry as well. And what they had done is they went in and they put in one megawatt worth of solar tracking to make electricity, so solar PV making electricity. Um, this was done on a mining brownfield. So you've got lots of available land that's very, very inexpensive. And so this was a great opportunity for them to utilize a good angle where they could get good sun on the side of a hill, uh, an area that was a brownfield that had been polluted and now could be used for other things and, and reused. Um, and they happened to put trackers in because they had a certain amount of grant money to support it. For them in particular, the cost of installation came to about $5.40 per watt. Exciting is that a, a local Alberta company out of Calgary, Skyfire, uh, did the actual design and installation. But if we fast forward just a little bit in time, the next major installation happened to be uh, Green Acres Hutterite Colony. And they made this decision on a purely economic basis without going with trackers and also without a lot of um, in, uh, support. They were able to put in now two megawatts of solar here in Alberta at about $2.40 a watt. And that, by the way, represents about 25% of all the solar in Alberta was done on just this one project. So it shows you how much room we have to grow for sure. If we look to uh, Banff, Alberta, so there's been a lot of leadership in municipalities and, and I've certainly had the pleasure of meeting a lot of them, including Don McCormick and Kimberly that we just saw and many other municipalities across the country. Uh, but Banff did something really neat and they did this purposely to be a leader. They didn't do it because it was the easiest path to follow. In fact, it was really complicated. Uh, but they set up their own feed-in tariff program right in Banff and they based it on a very simple premise. They did the math on what it would cost you to put a solar system in today and instead of setting a rate of subsidy, they set a rate of return. So they said, uh, I'm trying to remember the time period, I think it was 10 years, 15 years? Yes. Anyways, they established their subsidy at the level that would guarantee you a payback period. I think it was 10 years or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. So this is a very novel pro program that caught in, uh, national attention across Canada when they launched this last year. And uh, after doing this for three years and traveling across the country and, we, you know, yap, 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 yap about all this solar renewable energy stuff. I thought, is it hard to do? What are the economics of it? Can I do it myself? So I was the president of a community league here in Edmonton. This is Evansdale Community League in North Edmonton. And I took on my own project and gave it a whirl. And so <laughs> I found out it wasn't that hard to do. And it's a great form of community investment to take infrastructure money and build a solar system on a community hall. And so that's what I did. We, in the end, paid $3.20 a watt, which is a pretty good rate for a 13.6 kilowatt system. We left room on our roof, uh, the contract, I can't see from here, maybe you guys can see it better, but the, you can see the right half of the roof has room for just as much more and we'll probably add that at some point. Now think of this as a community investment. You take your own money that you raise, some infrastructure money, and instead of uh, pavement, which we still need to do, I get that, we just did uh, asphalt in my community league as well, but instead of the normal kind of infrastructure project that you build and depreciates over time, this is an infrastructure project that pays a dividend every month for the next 30 years. So we've just invested in this community uh, using infrastructure money. We've given them more income to operate soccer programs and whatever else they happen to do in their community league. So the other thing about this is you'll notice that the price per watt is higher than at the, um, the Hutterite colony. And uh, well, one important thing is that yes, it is higher and that's because it's harder to do the work on the roof rather than down on the ground with, with, with ground mount. Uh, but one of the things that you really will get here 
by putting your investments into things like community leagues, by supporting installations on people's roofs as, as uh, average citizens, is that you start to create a level of buy-in that's really critical to the long-term uh, adoption and connection of your citizenry with the transition. And so that's really critical because we could just leapfrog right into a whole bunch of uh, large-scale development. And, and at some point we want to do that because of the greenhouse gas offsets that that can afford us. But we need to create a, a cultural change within our society, particularly in Western Canada and Alberta, that it accepts this sort of thing as the first stage. Because otherwise we can see unfortunate outcomes, as we started to see in Ontario, where the large-scale stuff made it appear that people's utility bills were going up, and that's all they saw. It's better if people see, in their very own community, solar on roofs of community leagues, of their neighbors, etc. A bit more costly. So here's, a, here's a, an example of a solar game changer out of Calgary. So there's a really cool community called Eco Haven in Calgary. Um, I was very fortunate to have my students and I go down there um, just this, this uh, fall to see the, this and several of the other buildings in this community. And in this particular case, this, this building has a bunch of solar. And I'd like you to think about and maybe identify for me, how much solar do you happen to see on this building? Raise a hand, don't be shy, there's only, you know, 60 of us, 80, 100? Whatever. Whatever. Uh, how many solars do you see? So, by show, show me a hand. Who sees some solar here? Okay, what kind of solar do you see? Passive. What is it? Passive. You see some passive? Good work. Yes, yes. So the sun uh, is coming what in. What a keener. Uh, yeah. head on you. What a, the sun is coming in through these windows, and these windows are part of the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system of the house. Because these windows are high efficiency, the light is coming in in the winter and it's giving them actually heat. So that's one. Anybody else see some solar here? The rooftop has a whole bunch of solar PVs, photovoltaics, electricity generation on the roof. So there's our solar PV up on the top. A passive solar coming in because we've got big windows in the south. If you were in a really warm climate, you'd put the big windows on the north actually. Um, and then lastly, does anybody see one more solar? I sure didn't see this when David showed me this slide. There's actually embedded solar thermal on this building right here. These panels are actually solar thermal, which is quite fun. Do you want to say anything else? I know. Okay, good. So uh, solar thermal is their hot water system, so it creates hot water for, for the home. And uh, I didn't see that, and I've seen a lot of this stuff. He, uh, Dave Spencer, the guy who built the house and, and developed the neighborhood, uh, he got quite a chuckle out of that. So this leads us to a very important part of our story. Where is solar going and why is solar important for other reasons? It's, it's fine and dandy. You can make, make your electricity from solar. It's a nice clean source of electricity. But what other ramifications does it have for us? It turns out really significant other ramifications. So in 2007, uh, the Canadian government and their equilibrium program uh, supported 12 homes across Canada to be developed as net zero. So they wanted to see if it could be done, what it would take, how much it would cost, what kinds of systems they'd put in. So they supported 12 different projects like this across Canada. 2007, that's not even a decade ago. So this house was built, this is Riverdale in Edmonton. It was built by a team of 40 <laughs> engineers and, and folks who basically volunteered their time to be part of the project, to learn about the new technologies and that sort of thing, and they did an amazing job. The only thing is, uh, this building, to me, to my mind, is not something you would replicate, because it, it truly is the Starship Enterprise. Every showcase technology you can imagine is in this house, and you know, if you're worried about systems breaking down and having too many systems, simplicity is always better. They all work. This house is awesome today, uh, but this was just the beginning in 2007. So then we can fast forward just a little bit, and now there was, uh, I don't know if you remember a fellow by the name of Kevin Taft. He used to be liberal of the Alberta, uh, leader of the Alberta Liberals, and he had some land, and he had, uh, talking about infills, we heard that from the mayor today, he had a parcel of two pieces of property, and he rezoned that for three houses. And working with Effect Homes and uh, Habitat, um, um, they put in three houses that are all solar ready. And they were able to do this on a much simpler set of uh, technologies. So not nearly as enterprisey, but also not as many moving parts and a little bit cheaper and able to move through these solutions faster. Um, you can see the middle one actually has the solar already deployed upon it. 
uh, whereas the other two are ready for solar as, a, as an expansion. But it really does go to show that with a simpler design and in an Edmonton context of a, a huge number of builders that are really excited about immediately embracing net zero, we're seeing really good traction. And Edmonton, as was mentioned by the mayor, is the epicenter of, of net zero housing in Alberta, uh, sorry, in Canada. And this leads us quickly down the path. So uh, those homes, those net zero homes, you know what a net zero home is, everybody? It's a home that produces as much energy as it consumes over the course of the, averaged over the course of a year. So essentially you're producing all the energy you need to operate as a home. Those uh, custom builders uh, that started that revolution, Peter Amarangan that the mayor mentioned, and, and a whole bunch of others here in home, Les Wool that affect homes and many others, uh, all worked together on this to really push this along and build very simple, very efficient homes, some of the best actually in the world. This also inspired another character who had been involved in this process for a long time as well. He didn't just come to this uh, yesterday either. This is Reza Nasri, who's actually sitting right there. Sorry, Reza. <laughs> Uh, and he got this idea that we should have uh, not just make energy efficient homes for the rich, you know, the custom builders, uh, as they'll tell you, is anybody can build the fanciest home you want if you have money, but can we build them so that we can change the world and have all of our homes uh, energy efficient or even don't use any energy on a net basis? And that was Reza's vision. And so he got this idea from Germany of building his homes in a factory with no waste, uh, or very little waste, energy efficient, and, and with really high level of control over the tolerances of the building. So very accurate construction uh, mechanisms. And so the, the recycling bin is there in the bottom right. Uh, I remember this when I toured the place. So that's all the recycling left over uh, from building homes. They build two homes a day, up to two homes a day in this plant right here in Edmonton in controlled conditions. And so one of the big things, Part of this is not just about the environment, it's just about good business. If you don't waste wood, you're gonna save money and it's cheaper to produce the house. If you produce the house in the factory like this and you only heat that one space to a comfortable level, your workers are happy, they finish the house, they're not working outside in 20 below and you don't have those giant propane heaters blasting heat into that home when it's 20 below while you're trying to finish it and you don't end up with that giant waste pile, you've all seen them, in front of a new home when you're done. So it was just really smart business to do this. And so what Reza has been doing, plodding away through all these years, is to build the most energy efficient home he can, but in a production environment. Not a custom building environment, but a production environment. So he's, already, he's been adding these features as he goes, super uh, insulated homes using spray foam insulation, which you can afford to do if you do it in a plant, and you can't always afford to do it if you do it on site. Uh, adding air exchange systems, because when you make your house tight, you need to make sure you have enough fresh air in it. Uh, and it also allows you to des design an innovative system that preheats the air so you lose less heat. Uh, heat recovery drains, which you can see at, at the bottom there, and efficient lights and all all that sort of thing. So they've been plotting away at this, building one of the most energy efficient homes on the market, an average of something like Energide 84 uh, of their most recent standard. I don't know what it is this year. And so what would it take to take this slowly evolving, more efficient home all the way to net zero? Well, it turns out Solar is one of them, and the reason solar is a game changer is it's now affordable to do, and it makes sense, especially I would advise my own children to build a net zero home today, because if you can just tack it on your mortgage, it's the very smartest investment you're going to make. Skip the granite countertop, make it net zero, buy the granite countertop with your savings later on. So this is the other game changer, uh, you know, to simplify a really complicated process, this is the other game changer. This is called an air source heat pump. Do you know what geothermal heating is? where you exchange heat with the earth. Most people have heard of that, or geo-exchange. Well, this is, uh, this is an air source heat pump. This is like your fridge. Your fridge takes warm air inside, spits it out into your house, and cools the fridge. Well, that's exactly what this does. And these work uh, both forwards and in reverse. So you can cool the house or you can heat the house. But what's really important, and what was the big game changer, is these were only good to minus 10 uh, until very few years ago. Now some of them are rated up to minus 25, and we can build net zero homes in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada at 53 degrees north. Uh, thanks to this technology. This unit, once you've built your house and it's twice as energy efficient as the average previous home, uh, you don't need as much to heat it. So this unit, actually, this is called a mini split, costs about the same as a conventional furnace. Just before you do go on, I will say one thing. Um, this mini split is good to about minus 25 in terms of it being efficient. 
if your temperature goes below minus 25, your house won't freeze. Just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> Yeah, you're not doomed after that. And actually, a lot of homes have a, a small supplementary system, radiant heating or something, just in case. Yes. <laughs> and sorry, this is, my, this is my long series of slides, Jim, here. I keep wanting to let you in here. But uh, so where has this led us to? Well, since this, he's been doing these experiments with building homes all these years and trying to make them more energy efficient and heading towards this ever uh, elusive goal of making all homes net zero or net zero ready, which uh, Reza's been saying for years that he's going to get there. So uh, I, hope, I hope you're okay with that, Reza. Because <laughs> I know it's a big challenge. But look, this is a story I love to tell. These are net zero homes built by Landmark here in Edmonton. These are condo units itself or townhouses. I, I don't know the right terminology, but call them townhouses that you can buy for, I think one of the middle units was $465,000, something like that. Uh, to take this unit from their standard specification as of a year or two ago, all the way to net zero ready, the cost of that is $7,800. $7,800. So now you have a home that is ready to be net zero. The only thing it's missing is the solar. And at today's rates, you can add that solar for about $30,000. So your mortgage needs $37,800 to provide all your energy for the next 30 years. There's no gas line in these homes, so you're not paying $60 a month before you start buying gas. You don't even have that bill, let alone the fixed charges. You just have the electricity side. And so uh, that's how close we are. And actually, it does cost a little more for the end units. It's about $11,000 because they have to insulate, uh, put more insulation on the end wall. But that is a stunning achievement. And uh, what makes this important is, again, it's not just a few wealthy folks building really cool, efficient homes. These We're talking about a system that can start to be applied to all new homes that are built. And in uh, Landmark's case, Landmark Homes, uh, that's 800 to 1,000 homes a year, as you heard the mayor say. So that takes us to another concept of not just the residential, which is something you can do something about immediately and yourself as a homeowner, but also we've got a huge number of, of commercial buildings also in Alberta. This is a really exciting story about the Mosaic Center built by Dennis Cuckoo and others, um, a whole host of different companies working together to make this a reality. This is right now fully operational. This is Alberta's very first commercial net zero building. And um, that's really exciting because most net zero commercial buildings are in lovely places like, like Vancouver and down in the United States. If you can do this here in Alberta, in Edmonton specifically, where can't you do it? Okay, maybe the North Pole. So this is a really good story because not only is it about achieving net zero on an annual basis for a commercial, but it's also that there's lots of other um, very good community conscious uh, aspects of this building as well. But I won't go into those nearly as much other than to say it's a 30,000 square foot building and it's net zero on an annual basis. Um, that's a picture of the inside on the left. It's sustainable and it actually turned out to be affordable. Uh, it happens to have a lot of its power from solar. Uh, you can see that there is an effect where there is some snow, but that's not permanent. That does go away. Um, you can also see uh, in this particular case they have geo uh, exchange or geothermal heating and cooling. Um, they have natural lighting, a lot of natural lighting, so they don't have to use as much electricity uh, to make the, the building effective for their end users. Uh, it's very energy efficient. Um, the windows can open, but it doesn't have to, but you do have a fair bit of uh, flexibility as a, an end user, and it's very beautiful, and that can help increase productivity. When you have a staff that's not choking on toxic, toxic materials and actually has an environment with natural lighting and has an environment that is attractive. The secret sauce, as we would say, on why this was a very effective net zero building was that it did have the solar for the electricity, but it also had geo exchange. And so with geo exchange, you would dig these what are called boreholes and you would put loops down and you can transfer the heat between the ground and the atmosphere within the building. And you can, when you need cooling, you can pull up cooling. When you need heating, you can pull up heating. And so um, in an average home, given our natural gas prices in Alberta being really rock bottom, in your average home, maybe a, a 1,500 square foot house, geo exchange does not currently make economical sense. It works fine. Um, but Manitoba, it makes economic sense because their electricity prices are low and their natural gas prices are high. In Edmonton, not so much right now. However, when you get into larger buildings with a bigger volume and less surface area per volume ratio, 
all of a sudden it starts making a lot of sense. And that's exactly what made this a uh, possibility here. So the secret sauce was, and that shows you the big giant ditches out in front as they were uh, digging and making this geothermal. Um, the secret sauce was the geo exchanges your heating and cooling and it runs on solar. So now we change gears and just to show you a different way of thinking about this stuff there, there's a lot of really interesting things happening across Canada and this is one of the most dramatic stories I could think of. I, I must confess I wasn't a huge fan of ethanol, you know, making fuel from food. I just had a kind of a personal issue with it uh, until I went to this plant in Ontario. This is Chatham, Ontario and this is the Greenfield uh, ethanol plant. It's, they're now called Greenfield Specialty Alcohols uh, in Chatham, Ontario and this is an amazing facility. Facility. So here's how this big circle of life, this big industrial symbiosis thing works with this particular company. They buy 20 million bushels of corn from local farmers. They produce 100 million liters of ethanol. They sell back to the farmers 140,000 tons of distiller's grains. That's what's left after you take the corn and you make ethanol out of it. It actually turns out you have a, an animal food left over and quite a bit of it. And they sell that back to the same farmers. There's 100,000 tons of CO2 produced by this, like most factories produce a lot of CO2. But in this case, they have a Prax Air operation that harvests the CO2 because that's the business they're in, right on site, right integrated into the plant. They also make, and I'm not sure why they do this, but they make three to 4,000 tons of corn oil uh, just because, I guess. <laughs> it was one more thing they wanted to do. But here's what makes this cool. This fellow decided, he saw that smokestack, and he's a farmer from Ontario, and he had a small, some small greenhouse operations, and he decided uh, there, there could be a marriage here. And he went to the folks at Greenfield uh, Specialty Alcohols, and he proposed putting greenhouses across the street from the ethanol plant. And so in fact they have done that. They have plans to build 60 acres of greenhouse. Uh, that's a lot of greenhouse. Yeah. This is 22 acres of greenhouse and where I'm standing here with him he told me that if you did the 400 yard dash or 400 meter dash you could go in a straight line and never have to turn and you'd still be in the greenhouse. Uh, these are big greenhouses. So what does it do? They take the smokestack literally from the ethanol plant across the road, they pump it into a pipe under the road, and they harvest all of the heat, which is totally, was mostly wasted from the ethanol plant, uh, and they take it to heat the greenhouse. They take what's left of the CO2, about 20%, and they use that to actually artificially increase the levels of CO2. Here's a place where they want more CO2 uh, in a greenhouse full of tomatoes, and they're able to increase growth rates about 3 to 5% just by managing that concentration of CO2 inside the greenhouse. But also, the heat from that smokestack is going to provide about 50% of the heat for the greenhouse, which suddenly makes the greenhouse an economical operation, because if you had to pay for fossil fuel or any other kind of conventional heat, it probably wouldn't be economic. As they would say on TV, but wait, there's more. Um, so this is another exciting project also in the biofuels space. So James Callahan in Ontario, fifth generation dairy farmer, he sees that he has issues with a whole bunch of cow manure left over from his dairy operation. So right now he can get that out onto a field and may be able to get a little bit of money from his neighbors to spread this manure on the field. But it's generating methane and putting it into the atmosphere. And if you may well know that methane is way more potent as a greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide. So by spreading it out, you're going to get methane emissions. What he did as he worked with an automated system that would take these rakes, move really slowly. I don't know if you can really see it there, but basically it's just, it's just a bar on the floor on a chain that just gets dragged along. And uh, it's going along really slow, and, and as it comes up on the cows, the cows just kind of lift a leg and put their leg down as the rake goes by and lifts another leg, because they're not going to move. Come on, they're cows. But uh, basically, it's just cleaning up the poop all the time. And the rakes move along and it takes all the, the fecal material, that I'm a microbiologist, all the way to the other end and they collect all this up and they put it in what's called a biodigester. So that's the biodigester in the background there and it's basically a closed system that's kept warm and the bacteria that are actually in the poop actually start generating more and more methane, which is the major thing you would find in natural gas some carbon dioxide and basically you end up with natural gas and, and he's accumulating this natural gas and then what he does with it, instead of just letting that out into the atmosphere, they're putting it into a power plant and burning it. And they're now generating electricity. So now he has a revenue stream that's significant rather than a waste problem. 
And then uh, he can sell that in Ontario. He gets 16 cents per kilowatt hour to do that. And he burns this 24-7. Not that he has to. He doesn't have to be burning 24-7. If he was in the Alberta context, instead of getting 16 cents per kilowatt hour, instead what he would probably do is look for peak times in our, in our uh, electricity generation when you would get a lot of money for it. And he'd burn it then to make money that way. Um, so 16 cents per kilowatt hour allows him to borrow the money. He's got a 10-year payback. And then he can make electricity locally. You've got farm diversification, which is critical. Um, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, which is also critical. Reducing water pollution, when do I stop saying it's critical? And more importantly, from a renewable energy perspective, the, when the sun shines, you make electricity. When the wind blows, you make electricity. Those aren't dispatchable. In this case, if you store that natural gas, you've got a renewable energy system that you we call dispatchable. You can choose when you will or will not make electricity, which is a huge component of some of the things you've heard in the media about, yeah, but these systems, these renewables aren't dispatchable. Actually, some of those renewables are, in fact, dispatchable. Um, in Ontario, about 26 farms have done this so far, and a lot more are looking to be done. Some of them uh, are usually in the, just under the one megawatt size. Um, Alberta, with the amount of um, cows we've got, we could do probably about 100 of these things. Unfortunately, um, Germany's got about 5,000 of these. Ontario, about 28. Alberta, about two. So again, lots of room for growth. So we move from uh, cow poop. Uh, I never realized when I started this project that I'd spend so much time with uh, poo in my shoes, but uh, I have Went, wound up in a lot of different places, including the Vancouver sewer system, uh, where they're actually manufacturing heat out of using heat exchange in the Vancouver sewer system, which, by the way, they're talking about using at Blatchford here in Edmonton, I just learned the other day. So now I'm going to take you to, I'm a forester by education, I've never worked today, I've been a journalist uh, most of my life, but I am a forester by education, and this is the biggest mother of a pulp mill in North America, this is the Outback Mill in northern Alberta, this is the biggest craft pulp mill in North America, and uh, I never realized how this thing works. I had no clue until I went up there and did a tour and did a story on it. So here's a case where you've got an operation that, that's a pile of wood there, and those aren't toothpicks, those are trees. So if there were a, a, a semi-trailer parked in front of that, it would be about a, a I don't know, maybe a fifth of the way up in terms of height. That is a big pile of trees, and that goes for the equivalent of many, many city blocks uh, at the Alpac plant. So we're talking about a huge operation. They burn, in this case, uh, they burn... Okay, just to back up a second, they produce their own electricity at this plant. They exist out in the middle of nowhere, and of course, if you think about it, they need, uh, I think it's about 40 or 50 megawatts of electricity to run this plant, and it's going to be very difficult to pull that out of the grid uh, in northern Alberta in the middle of nowhere. So actually, by design, this plant has two 40 megawatt power plants built into it. One, uh, both high-pressure steam units that run off of two boilers. One boiler is fired with the waste uh, chemicals that you use to make pulp. It's called black liquor, and it's a great fuel. I saw it, how fast it burns. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and then the other waste they have is a lot of biomass, bark and whatever that they can't make out of pulp. Like, it's not much you can't use to make pulp, but bark and a whole bunch of other stuff, you can't actually just throw it in the pot and make uh, toilet paper out of it. So they have... That's one use. Uh, they have 450,000 tons of biomass waste uh, to burn, and they have the black liquor, two waste products. And, and so they burn those to generate their own electricity. But what's innovative about this project is a number of years ago, they added another uh, energy generation unit to this, a low-pressure steam unit that essentially runs on the waste of the other units to produce electricity. And so they added another uh, unit onto this that exports to the grid. So in this case, as Jim was talking about dispatchable, which is one of those weird mysterious words to me, but, uh, but these guys, much to my surprise, actually produce this electricity. This is a peaking power plant. So they only supply this electricity to the grid when they're asked to by the grid operator, which means they make a lot of money when uh, they do that. So they operate 22 days of the year, the one unit. But it's a very important service for the grid. But here's a renewable energy that's actually a peaking power plant. And Alpac made the decision not to be uh, nice to us or, or or any other public service, they did it because that's the way they're going to make the most money. And so it was a very simple decision for them. They actually have to keep it running 24-7 at a very low rate because if they don't produce their maximum electricity for the grid within 15 minutes after they're asked to, they don't get those prices. So 22 days of the year this operates. All waste 
that uh, goes into it. So I like to say there's good biomass and there's bad biomass. Generally, when it's waste, it's good biomass, speaking in a really gross general terms environmentally. So um, just a little bit more. Um, we got started a little late, so my apologies if we go a little late. Um, in terms of um, our next topic is around biodiesel. Now, of course, we've got a lot of vehicles, and some of those can be uh, switched over to electrification, which we'll talk about. But you can't necessarily electrify all vehicles. And so there, are a need, there is a need for other solutions uh, if we're going to change our predominantly pre petroleum derived transportation industry and transform that into something else. So this is a great story out of uh, the Vancouver, uh, sorry, the, uh, the BC West Coast, uh, Cowichan Biodiesel Co-op, uh, a, a group of gentlemen who were very passionate and they were just selling really four liter biodiesel jugs of biodiesel they had made from uh, French fry waste and that sort of stuff. And they were, they were making this stuff and then they were going to the uh, farmer's market and essentially selling it to one another. Um, so it's a very grassroots, not really a good economic business model, but they were very passionate about this. And, and they had been doing this for some time. And then they, they landed uh, the, the, the biggest fish of all. Um, out on the pier, they happened to have these large um, tourist boats coming in, not, not little tourist boats, but big things like this, and they actually landed a contract for yellow gold, cooking oil that is. Uh, they got this where they would get the cooking oil from some of the uh, large cruise line ships, and they would take that huge amount of waste oil, and they had to build themselves their own refinery in land. So they're taking it from the dock, going back, making this into biodiesel at their biodiesel refinery, and then taking it out and actually selling it to some, uh, some bus driving lines who happened to be the people who were taking all those tourists off the boat onto their bus and taking them for a tour and back, right? And so you actually have now tourists being driven around Vancouver Island on their own French fry of grease. And in this particular case, um, running biodiesel B100, it's actually on the side of the bus, just to indicate that this is 100% biodiesel. You can do that in, on Vancouver Island. It's a little harder here. You've got to be careful of your mixes because we get a little bit colder. But it's not insurmountable in our climate either. And, uh, and they also make so much of it, they also have a card lock for, for people who live in the Cowichan area. With their uh, Volkswagen diesel, that's not quite as oh, good as it yeah. used to be. <laughs> Or at least we thought it was better. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, you can't do one of these talks and not talk about transportation and cars and that sort of thing. And I ran across this story uh, about halfway through the series, uh, about halfway to where we are now in the series. And this is one of my favorite stories. This is about a guy who sells bird seed, who moved from Toronto to Saskatoon of all places uh, to go into business. And uh, he took over a company called Sun Country Farms, which makes bird seed. Any of you guys feed the birds? None? <laughs> One, okay, okay, us two, just the two of us. Um, I didn't understand how big a business Birdseed is. Apparently it's a really, really big business. So he moved all the way to uh, Saskatoon and he opened up uh, Sun Country Farms. It operates out of Langham, which is northwest of Saskatoon, up the highway, uh, out of that elevator that you see in the right there. But what makes this story so interesting is it started with Birdseed, and that was Kent, Ra this is Kent Rathwell, by the way, he's the owner of Sun Country Farms. Uh, he's a pretty amazing businessman. And so he had a relationship with Doug Anderson, who owns PV Marts. PV, you guys know PV Marts? You guys all city folks or what? <laughs> PV Marts are in every little town from Camrose to Red Deer to in the West. There's about 29 of them, I think, uh, in the West. Uh, and PV Marts are, are kind of like urban farming stores, kind of like hip farming stores. They're, they try to tread the ground between urban and rural. Uh, and apparently they have a large aisle of birdseed. That's Doug Anderson, the owner of PV Mart, standing in the birdseed aisle. And as he melodramatically explained to me, he walked from one end of this aisle to the other and he said, this is why I trust Kent Rathwell. I make a lot of money off Kent Rathwell. That whole aisle is Kent Rathwell. And so he, he already had a lot of respect for this guy. And Kent Rathwell got the idea that uh, he wanted to create 
he didn't just have a, a small uh, ambition. He wanted to create a carbon-free value chain. Now, you could say you just want to be more environmentally friendly, or you might want to use green energy or whatever. But no, he said, let's try to create a whole carbon-free value chain. So he set out to work on green energy in Saskatchewan. And he was sort of successful in getting programs going where he could purchase green energy. That was where he started. In it. And then he said, you know, you know what I really want to do is I want to start building the infrastructure for electric cars. If nobody builds that infrastructure, we'll never get the electric cars. It's the classic chicken and egg thing. And so he did. So he designed his own uh, fast level two chargers and a whole line of chargers using his money from Birdseed, because obviously uh, this is a crazy business to go into. The first thing they tell you in business school, don't try to lead the market. You know, produce something like food that people have to eat or clothes that people have to wear, but not EV chargers in a province like Alberta where there's probably 200 electric cars. You've seen one 200th of the electric cars in Alberta because it's right out there in the lobby right now. Not exactly a, a huge market for a guy who wants to build electric vehicle chargers, but here's a man on a mission. And so he did that, he designed them, and he went out and he convinced Doug Anderson to put a green parking spot in front of every PV Mart uh, there is in Canada right at the front door and to allow free electric vehicle charging using these fast chargers. Then he convinced Best Western, Ikea, and apparently a few other places. So here's a guy way ahead of the market and there's, I think there's about 2,200 of these charging stations now on this map. This guy has single-handedly created the longest chain of vehicle charging stations in the world right here in Canada. And he's done it ahead of the market. There's only three markets in Canada that have significant electric cars, BC, Ontario, and Quebec, and that's because they've had programs. And as I said in Alberta, I'm guessing at 200 cars, I can only find evidence of 100, but if you put the information together, uh, there's got to be more than, than, than we know about. So, Kent uh, is on a mission uh, to create the longest green highway, and 90% of that highway is free. So if you buy yourself a Chevy Volt today or whatever, and you head out down that highway, you can charge for free all the way across Canada. Just make sure you have your coffees at PV Marts and your sleeps at Best Western. So maybe this wasn't such a crazy idea after all, though, uh, I'm thinking, because I just ran across this stat recently, and they estimate by 2020 there will be, there'll be a need for 11.4 million EV charging stations in the world. So maybe it wasn't such a crazy idea. So this leads us to, what do you take to these charging stations? Uh, not my wife's hybrid, you take an electric car. <laughs> and so uh, electric cars open up a whole bunch of really interesting ideas. So we're going to start the story with some stats. I get to be the stats guy. So, um, so this is a curve of growth in the EV market around the world. And, and you may notice that this is, again, much like we saw with the solar, and if I'd shown you the, the slides for, for batteries, you can see it's, again, an exponential curve. So um, perhaps we see this curve starting to you know, increase in maybe 2012, 2013. We start to see a, an a increase. And it's exponential. It's doubling every year. And it's, it's a crazy growth curve. And so there's lots of lots of opportunity. But right now, those EVs are really, as, as it says there, really in their earliest phase, they're really only um, toddlers. Um, but we're seeing solid growth rates. And um, we can also see some good possibilities. If we could get these cars to interact with our electrical grid, then we'd have some really significant value, uh, value at bringing to, being brought to renewables. So one of the things you'll hear in the media is, oh my goodness though, these renewables are intermittent and there's no way that we could possibly hope to build enough batteries. But if we actually were to roll out, and this is the Danish model actually, the, the De in Denmark they're actually saying, if you buy uh, sol uh, sorry, uh, uh, battery powered electric cars, we'll actually reduce the amount of tax we'll take from you. And as a result, they're rolling out more and more electric cars there. And what they want to do is have a smart grid where you can plug your car in and buy electricity off the grid when there's lots of electricity. That is to say, you as a car owner would buy low. Then when the grid needs your electricity, there would be a computer that would figure out where do you, you want to actually sell your electricity back to the grid at, and you would sell high. So when you've got a lot of solar resource or you've got a lot of wind resource, individual people's cars that they need for transportation anyway would now be buying low automatically, buying low and selling high on the electrical market. Your car now is not just a depreciating uh, instrument as was described by our mayor, but now is all of a sudden a wealth generating device that can do it automatically in 
projecting itself into a smart grid format and at the same time solving some of those energy storage problems that we are uh, currently seeing in places like Hawaii where you're over 15 or 20 percent solar. Just to give you a hint, uh, we're under 0.1 percent. Um, in terms of emissions, um, there are some locations where a coal plant generated sort of grid would give you more pollution from an EV than in other places, but it's really actually quite rare. You'll hear a lot of talk about that, but there's very few jurisdictions. For the most part, solar, uh, uh, sorry, EV power, uh, EV cars actually um, are going to give you less emissions than other, uh, other vehicles. Um, and there's some really exciting things. For example, the fuel is way cheaper. Your maintenance costs are way cheaper. And if you buy a Tesla, you can go zero to 100 in 2.8 seconds. What's not to love? And those cars um, are, yes, $80,000, $100,000, but way cheaper than a Lotus. <laughs> so uh, what do you think the best-selling electric car in Canada is today? Not in Alberta, by the way, but in Canada. <laughs> what is the best-selling electric car? Is it the Tesla at 100 grand or 150 grand, whatever you want to spend on this? I, I think it's about 150 grand if you want ludicrous mode, which, by the way, is faster than James Bond car. Anybody seen James Bond? He's driving that Austin Martin like he always does, but all he could manage to get out of that was the 0 to 103.2 seconds. So actually, the Tesla sedan beats them. Is it the Tesla sedan at 100 uh, grand plus? Is it the Chevy Volt at around 42, 45, 43, somewhere in there? Uh, or is it the smart EV at 27 grand? Little, uh, looks like a little smart car, but it's electric. Uh, or is it the Nissan Leaf at 38 grand, kind of in the middle of the pack? So what do you think? How many for the, Tesla. how many for the Tesla? Yeah. Best selling in Canada. How many for, got a couple there. How many for the Volt? How many for the Smart EV? Few. How many for the Leaf? Oh, you guys are Leaf fans. Wow. Uh, you should be Oilers fans. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's actually the Chevy Volt. And uh, this is all-time sales in Canada. So the Chevy Volt is still well ahead of the Leaf in Canada. The Tesla Model S sells uh, actually pretty well, like 2,700 of those. Uh, and remember, those are 100 to $150,000 cars. So actually, the value of the third graph is much higher than the value of the, third, of the first graph, just saying. Uh, and in the US, this changes a little bit. The Nissan Leaf actually is very, very close to the sales of the, uh, of the Chevy Volt. The reason the Chevy Volt is so popular right now, it's kind of thought of as an electric car, but it's really kind of a hybrid car. Uh, you can actually get 600 kilometers out of it. But with the increased range of the new model, uh, most, I think it's 90% of our trips are 30 kilometers or less on average. And so if you have a car that has 80 kilometer range or something like that, you're going to be driving on electricity most of the time. So you're still going to get all the benefits of electricity, but you can drive 600 kilometers. So uh, I think that's probably the reason why the Volt is uh, the best seller, uh, because we're still in that transition period to electric cars. I've been in a Volt. I love the Volt. I'm not buying a Tesla. I don't make that much, but uh, I would consider buying a Volt. Uh, so the best non-electric car in the market, this is my wife's car. Uh, this is a Prius C, and they were rated at 77 miles per gallon before they decided to get a teeny bit more honest with the rating system, and they've downgraded it a bit. So now these are rated at 66 miles per gallon. Uh, and like all cars, they've come down a little bit uh, because they're trying to be a little more honest with the rating systems. Um, so then, what is the cheapest source of electricity on Alberta's grid? You'll hear a fair bit that some of the technologies are not yet ready for prime time and they're still too expensive. Um, the exciting thing is that when we look at the different ways of making electricity on the Alberta grid, there, are, there, there is a pool price, it's called, where um, there's a demand for a certain amount of electricity and producers of electricity bid in to say, okay, well, we'll, we'll bid in for three or five or ten or twenty cents per kilowatt hour and and if there's enough need they might get paid that twenty cents per kilowatt hour but if there's not enough need they've bid in at twenty they won't actually get to sell their electricity they'll, they'll be told oh no we don't need your super expensive electricity for this fifteen minute period and they just keep rolling out these 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 auctions and that means that our prices that are here are really quite real prices we actually know what the cost of generating electricity is based on what these companies are actually getting paid 
by us for the actual electricity they put on the grid. So you can see from that that our entire pool is about eight cents per kilowatt hour. Coal is cheaper, but it's not super cheaper, but it is cheaper at about 7.7 .7 cents per kilowatt hour. Natural gas, a uh, combined cycle, would be at about 8.3. When you get into peaker plants, though, you're up at like 21 cents per kilowatt hour. But the interesting thing is down at the bottom in the orange, we have wind in Alberta. And wind really, on average, only gets paid 5.5 cents per kilowatt hour. That's a real number, or those people wouldn't be making wind farms. So actually, wind is the cheapest thing on the Alberta grid today. That is to say, renewables actually, in this particular case, wind, is actually cheaper than the other things on the grid right now. So if you're being challenged in the future by somebody saying, oh, no, no, it's, it's too expensive to do renewables, some of them, that's just not true. Anything you want to add? No, that's good. Thank you very much, and thanks for your questions. Uh, come and chat with us if you like, and thanks for coming. <laughs>